So that fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? Amen. So that fella didn't take the sacraments. Didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary. Didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe. Didn't tithe. He went to heaven. He went to hell. You saved? Didn't keep the law. He didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments. He broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule. He didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory. He woke up in the pit. Are you saved? Amen. You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. It's like that. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah. All right. In this video, I want to talk about the nation of Israel. Now, before I get into this, I want to make a disclaimer that Israel as a nation, as its leadership and majority of its population, reject Jesus Christ, their own God, their Messiah, their King, and they have Tel Aviv being the gay capital of the world and going against God's law, that they're using this star here that is not the Star of David. There isn't a Star of David. It appears to be the Star of Repham, which God rebuked Israel for putting up in Amos. And Stephen in Acts chapter 7 speaks about this as well, right before the Jews stoned him to death. And the Jews did give over Jesus to the Romans to be crucified. Right? Not to mention we have a lot of Jews who are dual citizens with Israel and America in the government, in unelected positions of America. And we also have, what is it there? This last thing slipped my mind a little bit. Oh yes, like the Rothschilds and other Zionist Jews' control of banking, causing a lot of issues with the world's economy and doing a lot of evil, no doubt. And I get why you would be against Israel and why a lot of people would call them the synagogue of Satan. Jews who say they're Jews, but are they are not. But just because they're not following God they're not accepting Jesus and they're doing evil doesn't mean that they're not Israel. It doesn't mean that they're not God's chosen. There's a couple of things from scriptures I would like to bring to your attention. One is from Ezekiel, where Ezekiel says, I do not this for your sake. So let's come over here. Ezekiel 36:22. Let's scroll down here. It says here, Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for mine holy name's sake, which ye have profaned among the heathen whither ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among you, among the heathen, I'm sorry, among the heathen, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the heathen shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the heathen and gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take away the stony heart of your flesh, and will give you an heart of flesh. 
and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall dwell in the land that I give to your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will also save you from all your uncleanness, and I will call for the corn, and I, and I will increase it, and lay no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of the tree, and increase of the field, that ye shall receive no more reproach of famine among the heathen. Then shall ye remember your own evil ways, and your doings that were not good, and shall loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I this, saith the Lord God. Be it known unto you, be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. So you see here, God is doing this for Israel, not for their sake, not because they are good and holy and just and righteous and a godly people that follow after God's word and law perfectly and accepted Jesus as the Messiah and King. He does it in spite of them because God made promises. He said, these are my chosen people. I'm going to bless you because of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, your fathers. I've made promises to them, and I'm going to keep them in spite of you. Israel is an example of God's mercy and grace. Mercy as in they don't get what they deserve, and grace is in they get what they don't deserve. And we, we do not judge righteously. We judge by sight. We don't pay attention to God saying, these are my people. And in spite of them, I'm going to do these things because I made promises to their fathers. It's not about them. But we make it about them, thinking they don't deserve it. No mercy or grace for them. And when we condemn them in such a way, we condemn ourselves in the same way. That we shouldn't deserve God's mercy and grace. Because in reality, we're no better than they are. We're sinners just like they are. And matter of fact, if we were in their position, we'd probably be doing the same exact thing. Another passage I want to bring up to you. This is Old Testament. Let's let's go to the New Testament. Let's go to Romans. I believe it's chapter 10, might be 11. I think it's actually 11. And here, Paul is talking about the remnant of Israel here. The Gentiles being grafted in. But then he mentions about how all... Israel would be saved here. So let's let's focus on this here. Verses 25 through 32 here it says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So don't be ignorant of this. Pay attention. All right? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So you see, they're blind right now. That's why they don't accept the truth of the scriptures. They don't accept the truth about Jesus. It goes on to say, And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion a deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And what we need to realize is that there's going to be an Antichrist who shows up, who tries to get them to accept him as the Messiah. You see, because the blindness is going to be lifted off the eyes of Israel. And who wants to be standing there when their eyes are open? Satan. So they think that he is the Messiah. And he's going to be posing as Christ. So you need to realize that when this supposed Jesus shows up, it's not really Jesus. Even if at first he's supporting the Jews, he's supporting Israel. Because he's not going to be supporting the Roman Catholic Church or the papacy, right? One of the key things you need to watch out for there, he's not going to be supporting Islam either. So if he's speaking with forked tongue, supporting all of the groups trying to bring unity, it's, that's not Jesus. He made no promises to the Catholic Church, no promises to Islam. There's nothing he's doing for them. They've rejected him. He has no covenant with them. He has a covenant with Israel. Right? And if you're a Jew, you need to realize it as well, because your eyes are going to be open soon here. As it says at verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they, the Jews, Israel, are enemies for your sakes, 
But as touching the election, as in the chosen of God, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So you see, even though there are enemies, we need to understand that this is part of God's plan. They are blinded right now. They're enemies of ours because they are blinded. As he goes on to say, for the gifts of, and calling of God are without repentance. So everything that he promised to Israel, he says he's not repenting of it. He's not going to turn from it. They're going to get what he promised. For as ye in times past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed, that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all. So you see how Israel is a beacon of God's mercy and grace, where people should look at Israel and see how they deserve hell, but God is merciful and doesn't give it to them. How they don't deserve being in the position they are in, but God is gracious. And praise God for his mercy and grace, because this is also what he bestows upon us as individuals. And we should be praising God for that, instead of cowering down to Islam, where Israel has been trying to make peace with these Muslim nations, and even giving over land to them. And what does Islam do? These Muslim nations and these terrorist groups, they launch attacks from the land that Israel gives over. And I've been talking to these people who are pro-Palestine, saying that Israel is committing genocide. And it's like, seriously? Look at the size of the Muslim nations compared to Israel. And Israel, defending itself against its neighbors, is committing genocide? Are you serious? So I ask them, what can be done to have peace? And they act as though as Israel is occupying their land. And how can you have peace with somebody who's basically came into your home and is living in your house? And I was like, oh, so you're basically saying they need to leave. But there's nowhere for them to go. Where is Israel going to go? If the whole nation of Israel, the whole populace, is going to take all their things and leave Israel, where do they go? Hmm? Do you just exterminate them? You commit genocide upon them? We just repeat World War II, which is exactly what's going on. The world is getting fired up. And the Jews are the enemies, just like World War II. Never again. Oh, here is history repeating itself again. That's strange, huh? This small group there, surrounded by what, like a billion plus Muslims? And there's not even half a billion Jews? Probably not even a quarter of a billion Jews? And they're the ones committing genocide, but they need to get lost or die, give up the land. When Israel has offered two-state solutions... But these things aren't accepted because Islam doesn't want a two-state solution. They don't want Israel to be there. Yet you guys, on Palestine side, on the Muslim side, start talking about how Israel, the evils of Israel, and how they deny Jesus. But then you go and support Islam, which says God has no son. And they deny Jesus is the Savior, that he died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day. They don't even believe he really died on the cross. It was some imposter. They deny all of this, yet you condemn Israel for the same thing. I talked to one of these people and they were saying, well, Islam is more credible than Judaism. I was like, well, how so? And they said, well, look at the worldwide flood and the Tower of Babel. And I was like, okay, okay. Well, you're atheist, and most of the Jews are atheists anyway. They don't really believe that. But Islam truly believes that. They actually believe in the worldwide flood. They believe in the Tower of Babel. They believe that same thing. So if you're going to say is Israel or Judaism is not credible compared to Islam. They believe the same thing. They believe they believe, they claim to believe the Bible. 
which says the exact same thing, right? They claim to believe those stories. So the nonsense that I get from this side is actual just cowardice. They're afraid of the Muslims because there's so many of them. And they now have large communities in Europe that they're afraid if they upset them, they're going to do something. You know, you know why people are like this? Because they're pussies. In schools, what do they do? If a bully hits you and you hit him back, the teachers get mad at you, not the bully. So they've been teaching you not to stand up to the bully. And you don't know what to do when the bully comes at you. So you are afraid of these barbarians. When you want these dogs to back down, you don't run from the dog. You don't give in to the dog because then the dog thinks he's boss and he takes over. You stand up and you punch the bully in the mouth. And you re you stand up to the dog and let him know you're the alpha. You're the you're standing up for yourself, and they back down because they want easy road. That's why whenever Islam attacks Israel, the smaller nation, then they start going, "Hey, help us! They're attacking us!" When they start hiding behind their own women and children, they don't want to get hit back. They're cowards. But they bark loud and get all hyped up, and you get scared, and you want to give in to them. And a lot of you claim to be Christians as well. Faithless cowards. I even talk to Catholics about how the Catholic Church is saying Islam worships the same God. When one of the 99 names of Allah is the great deceiver. And he says he has no son. And you know, It's like, you worship the same God? And they're like, well, they're just trying to make peace so, you know, that the Muslims don't attack us and stuff. I was like, what are you, a coward? Why do you got to appease their lies and their bullshit? You're afraid they're going to come get you? Have you have no faith in God? Do you not truly believe your own religion? It's just disgusting. America, home of the brave, my ass. Anyway, that's that. You should support Israel, not for their sakes, but for God. God chose them, not because there's anything special about them, but because they're good, godly, righteous people. Because he made promises to their fathers who were his friends. So you support them for God. Right? Just like you may have friends now. And their children are pompous. Or you have brothers and sisters whose children are pompous. and Just brats and spoiled. You don't quite like them, but... Their family, and you support them because of your brothers and your sisters and because of your friends. But this is God's. So thanks for watching. And hear me out. Take care. All right, I just wanted to make a quick video here to put at the end of all my videos encouraging you to prayfully get into the scriptures as we read here in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse 2 it says looking on to Jesus the author and finisher of our faith and this is very interesting that it refers to Jesus as the author of our faith an author is somebody who writes and in Romans chapter 10 Verses 16 and 17, it says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you see here how Jesus is the author and finisher of our, finisher of our, of our faith, and how you get faith from hearing the word of God. Jesus is the word of God. The Bible, the scriptures, are the written word of God. It is God 
in our world. It's God's representative in our world, and that would be the King James Bible. And if you're saying it doesn't say read, it says hear. Well, then read it out loud, my friends. I know some of you are wise asses, and that's what you're going to say. Well, then read it out loud. And you build your faith. And you notice how obeying the gospel here is about believing it. That's how you obey it. The gospel is the good news of our salvation. That Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again according to the scriptures. But coming back to the word of God here, we are told in Isaiah 34, 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. This is very fitting because Isaiah has 66 chapters, just like there's 66 books in the Bible. And if you do a study on this, you can see that each chapter of Isaiah lines up with each book of the Bible. The first chapter for Genesis, the last chapter for Revelation, have fun doing that. And why should you seek out the book in the, of the Lord and read? So that Jesus never tells you this. Ye do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, as we read here in Matthew 22, 29, when he's talking to the Sadducees who are coming to him with a very silly question that anybody could answer if they actually knew the scriptures. But you see, the Sadducees, they didn't use the whole Old Testament. They just used Moses. So they didn't get the light from the Old Testament to help you understand the Torah. Just like the New Testament shines light and helps you understand the Old Testament. None of it adds or removes from what Moses wrote. It helps you understand what Moses wrote. That's why Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law, which is the instructions, the Torah, what God told Moses to write, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of your Bible there. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So you see, you test the people to see if they actually have light in them. There's people who have an outward show of light, as Satan himself can come as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. But how do you test the spirits to see if there's truly light in them? They have to line up according to the scriptures. Jesus was not afraid to be tested in the scriptures. He would say, have you not read? Uh, it is written. To search the scriptures. Bring them up. They testify of me. Right? He wasn't worried about that. Paul wasn't either. Acts 17, 11. He wasn't worried about being tested in the scriptures. He didn't make some nonsense about you can't understand the scriptures. You need me to interpret them. No, he, he actually called the Berians noble for hearing what he had to say and then searching the scriptures to see if it was so. Because that's what we're supposed to do. If you don't line up with the scriptures, you're not of God. Very simple, very easy. God made it very easy for us to know him and to know who is not of him. He gave us his word and it's super simple. If it doesn't line up with him, then obviously it's somebody else trying to say that they're from him. A stranger. Trying to kidnap you, right? What does Jesus tell us about the word? In John 17, 17, he says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So you Christians that want to be sanctified, and you're trying to sanctify yourself by repenting of all your sins so that you become sinless, you want that sanctification. You need to get into the word because when you have the word abiding in you, God changes you from the inside out where you're not making the change, where you sanctify yourself by becoming some sinless being, by focusing on your sins and fighting against them. No, that's just cleaning the outside of the cup and containing your sinful nature. You need to come to Jesus to be born again, sealed with his Holy Spirit, and become one with his Spirit. And as Jesus says in John 6, 63, his word is spirit and it is truth. Flesh profits nothing. You get into the word. You are partaking of the Spirit of God, and God's Spirit is life-giving, as we see in Genesis, bringing life to things that have no life. You want that life. You want to be sanctified. You need to get into the Word. As we're told here in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, 
that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So how do you receive this cleansing? By getting into the word. It is spirit. The spirit is in reference to water. You want that cleansing? Get into the word. That's where you are going to be sanctified. So that you would be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. No blemish whatsoever. You need to get into the word so that Jesus is abiding in you and you are abiding in him. You see that? So, moving on to this last verse here. John 17, 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Because the only way to know the Father is to know the Son. You can't come to the Father without going through Jesus. When you know Jesus, you know the Father, because they are one. Jesus is the Father in the flesh. And eternal life is to know them. That's why Jesus says in Matthew 7, to these people who are doing a lot of great works in his name, they're prophesying in his name, they're casting out devils in his name, they're doing many mighty works in his name. And Jesus says, I never knew you. You see, you're saved not because of your works, not because you repented of your sins, not because you're perfect and you've deserved it and you've earned it somehow, that you've proven yourself. No, you're saved because of your relationship with God. If you've come to the cross and have been born again, then you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. You become one spirit with the Lord. There's no way Jesus can say, I never knew you. Because he knows you. He made you anew at the cross. He knows you intimately. You're saved at that point. You need to have that deep relationship with God. Just as... Adam knew Eve and she conceived. You need to know God on that level where you are born again. You receive the word of God, which is the seed of God, into your heart, which would be your womb. I know as a man, you might not want to think of that, but that's how it is. Eat the humble pie so that you receive the seed of God, that you may be born again. You see, the women help us understand our role to God. Because to God, we are the bride, the bride of Christ. We are as the woman. So you need to eat the humble pie, receive the seed, so that you can be born again. But a lot of Christians, they are just like a lot of women today. We don't need a man. So they're never going to be born again. Right? A lot of Christians, we don't need God. We can do it ourselves. And they take on the name Christian. Christians seem to be the easiest people to fool. Because all you got to do is say you're Christian. And they'll follow after you. You can be preaching lies because they don't test you to the scriptures. Donald Trump is a good example of a lot of Christians just blindly following him because he said he was Christian. Even though when he asked was asked if he comes to Jesus to ask for forgiveness. He says, no, no, I don't really do that. I, I don't really see myself as a bad person and I just try to do better. So he's not a Christian. He's never been born again. He doesn't believe the gospel, the good news of our salvation. He doesn't even believe he needs it. Yet the Christians are holding him up as if he's Christian and as if he's the, the savior of our country. Right? They're making an idol out of him. And he, obviously he's a pompous ass. Right? And the only reason why he looks good is because the left looks so bad. If it wasn't because of the left looking so hideous, you would be able to see clearly that Trump is no better. He just says you what you want to hear. But then somebody like me, who preaches to you the truth, but then I might say a word you don't like. Like I might say shit or ass. And all of a sudden you're offended and you turn off the video right here saying, this guy's not a Christian. You never listen to a thing I say because I said a couple of words that the Bible doesn't say not to say. The Bible doesn't say not to say any words like that. It says not to have corrupt speaking 
in guile. Corrupt speaking is what you get from politicians like Trump. That lie. And that's what guile is. It's manipulation. Fake, feigned words. Flattery. I'm not doing that. I'm not speaking anything corrupt. I'm just, instead of saying crap or butt, sometimes I end up saying shit or ass. And me saying that right now, you probably getting mad. And that's probably because you're an immature Christian, or not even Christian at all. You're just Christian in name only. And that's why you follow fake Christians so easily. So if you're offended by such things, have fun. Go away. You're not breaking my heart. You're, you're not taking anything from me. You're only hurting yourself by rejecting the truth and following after bullshit. So thanks for watching. Now I'm going to splice into something from Rockman that I really enjoy for the end of this. Take care. That fella couldn't join the church. He couldn't join the church. He couldn't get baptized. He couldn't get baptized. He woke up with God. He woke up with the devil. Are you saved? So that fella didn't take the sacraments, didn't take the sacraments. Didn't say the rosary, didn't take the rosary. Didn't tithe, didn't tithe. He went to heaven, he went to hell. You say? Didn't keep the law, he didn't keep the law. He broke the commandments, he broke the commandments. He didn't keep the golden rule, he didn't keep the golden rule. He woke up in glory, he woke up in the pit. Are you saved? You're saved. If you're not saved, you're over here or you're over here. You sure ain't in the middle. He said, Lord, remember me, thou comest by kingdom. And Jesus turned to him and said, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be saved. Amen. It's like that. Yeah. You have been saved? Yeah. If you ever saved, you were saved like that. Yeah.